Thank you for inviting me here. I'm from Ireland, as, as you know. I just uh, would like to say in relation to what Keith said, uh, because we have a history of referenda in Ireland on EU treaties, uh, but unlike Keith's attitude, where he may have one position but decides it's the people who should have the choice, most politicians in our country don't think in that way. And people here may think, well, why have we had, had so many referendums in Ireland? Are Irish politicians more democratic than other countries? No. The only reason we have had referendums is because we have a written constitution which ensures that any power that's been handed over by our government to another authority has to be decided by the people. It is the people who have the final say. Now, our politicians tried uh, in the Single European Act in 86 to pass the Single European Act without a referendum. It had to go to the Supreme Court by an individual citizen who challenged them. The courts found that it was completely wrong for the government to pass this referendum. It was unconstitutional. They would have to go to the people and get the people's verdict on it. And as a result, since that, we've had referenda on every EU treaty since. Now, in the most recent one, which was the Lisbon one, I'll come to in a second, there was a real reluctance to, let it, to allow us to have a referendum on that. But, for example, on the Maastricht Treaty, where we voted on joining the Euro, there was no debate whatsoever. While we did have referenda, the referenda were very undemocratic. They used public money for propaganda purposes to support a yes vote to ensure they got the result they wanted. When we were debating the Maastricht Treaty, we never discussed the single currency, the government, not once, never discussed it. So when we joined the single currency, people were actually gobsmacked that we had joined it. When did we make this decision? At Maastricht, we, most of the, the focus was on Ireland's favourite topic, abortion, which had nothing to do with the referendum whatsoever or the treaty itself. That was a clever ploy, ploy by the government. I took a case at that time to challenge the government's right to use public money. And eventually, in 1995, the Supreme Court decided that the government were acting unconstitutional. And as a result, there was funding. If they wanted to spend money, they would have to give it to both sides. Now, there's a long history there, which I wouldn't have time to go into. But on the Nice Treaty, the pu public voted against the Nice Treaty. We were then asked again to vote a second time with declarations attached, which were legally not binding in the same way as the treaty was. And it was said here this morning that when we voted no, we got certain concessions. Neither in Nice nor in Lisbon did we get any concessions. We got n declarations attached, which were not part of the treaty itself, because it would have had to go back to every member state to ensure that those changes were accepted by all the other governments. So they didn't have the same legal status as the treaty. On the Lisbon Treaty, and I'm going to come to this because I think it's key, Keith mentioned there about the EU is not without its faults. The EU and the Lisbon Treaty or the EU Constitution demonstrates this in the best way possible. It's not just that it's not without its faults. It's based on a foundation of a non-democratic procedure which has coerced behind closed doors politicians have collaborated to deny people the right to have their say. And the Lisbon Treaty is the best example of that. When the EU Constitution was originally drafted, it went to the citizens in France and the Netherlands, and they both rejected it. What did they do? They took it back and they regurgitated it with a different title called the Lisbon Treaty. It couldn't, the Irish people could not be denied a vote, even though, and at this, there's document, documented evidence of this, EU leaders tried to prevent Ireland from having a referendum, and our government, would have agreed to that if they hadn't been able to get away with it, but they weren't. And what happened? We voted no, and after we voted no, they came back to us again and asked us to vote again on the exact same treaty. But in the meantime, the EU Commission and the EU institutions and our own government, which refused to accept the verdict of its own people, conspired behind our back to ensure that they got the result they want. They spent, spent massive amounts of your money, my money, and other citizens right throughout the member states of the EU to ensure they got the result they want, wanted. They spent spent a huge amount of money researching why people voted in the particular way they did. A lot of women, unemployed, socially deprived, and they targeted all of these areas to ensure that those people would vote yes the next time around, and that's what happened. There is no democracy within the EU, and when we say that it has its faults, it's based the Lisbon Treaty went through by politicians who knew that if they gave their citizens the right to vote on it, they would have rejected it. Now, I ask you, what kind of democracy is that that's built on the denial of the people of having their say? And one thing I'll just say, 
And I'll finish on this. Your Westminster, your parliament is full of politicians who talk about other people in other parts of the wo world having their right to a democratic decision-making process. The most recent example is in relation to Libya, and they criticised Gaddafi, and rightly so, for being a dictator and not allowing his people the right to have their say. Any politician who votes to deny you your, your, deny you your right to have a say on Monday is no better. They are refusing to allow you to have your say, and you must have it.